I'm excited uh, for our guest today in the studio. Nice to finally be back. I've got my friend Tim Ward, mortgage broker, in the house today to talk about all things mortgages. And I thought uh, the way that we do the show today is a little more uh, rapid fire. Just want to ask a bunch of questions that come up uh, with, with me and my clients on a daily basis. And actually, some of the information is just stuff that I'm personally looking for information on. So, Tim, one of the best in the business, and uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mike. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you inviting me here today. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I thought we'd get started today with just talking about like some generalities that we're, we're, we're seeing in the mortgage real estate business. There's a lot of news about interest rates uh, being on the rise. Um, where do you think things are going in 2022 and, uh, and how fast do you think they're going there? For sure. So the last um, the last comment from the Bank of Canada is that, you know, we're probably going to see uh, the Bank of Canada overnight lending rate increase, which is uh, that um, uh, affects the prime lending rate, which is going to affect people's variable rate mortgages. Um, we've already seen fixed rate mortgages increase and they have been on the increase, you know, in the past few months. Um, so they're already climbing, actually. So we're no longer in the, you know, sub 2% fixed rate uh, market anymore. We're closer to 3% now. Um, the difference between fixed and variable is that that, um, variable rates are based off of the Bank of Canada um, overnight uh, lending rate and therefore the prime rate, uh, which is what we give you a discount on for that. Whereas fixed rates are more determined by the bond yields, uh, which is like a longer term outlook uh, for Canada. Uh, one thing that actually may see the fixed rates sit flat or even kind of decrease a bit now is the um, the conflict that we've seen in Russia and U Ukraine um, that's you know escalated today uh, as of when we've recorded this, um, which is potentially going to drive those bond yields down a, a little bit, which may see fixed rates decrease a little bit. Okay. So I think um, the Bank of Canada was talking about, so, so they, they kind of laid out where the rate increases would be this year. Right. So, so we think the next one's going to be March. March. What they seem to have indicated is going to happen. So it depends which economists you talk to and how they feel um, or what they say. And, you know, Scotiabank, I think, has gone quite uh, aggressive with how many increases they think are going to happen. You know, they're saying potentially seven yeah. this year or in the next kind of couple of years, which seems a little bit aggressive uh, to myself. We're definitely going to see a few uh, increases yeah. to the prime lending. And, rates and when they do those rate hikes, would it likely like are we, we talking like a a quarter, a quarter point. Like if if I'm if I'm on the fence about buying a house right now, it's not likely that you know the mortgage rate's going to run away from me by one and a half percent in the next thirty days. So right? the big concern that people typically have is that they they don't really understand how variable interest rates work. Um, so they think that um, interest rate could double overnight. They think if that happens, their payment will double overnight. Um, they don't run like that in tandem with one another. So. Um, Typically, a 0.25% increase uh, is what happens when the Bank of Canada raises their overnight lending rate. Um, they can do that eight times throughout the year. So there are pre-scheduled dates throughout the year when that happens. Um, you can look them up online. Uh, I provide information like that to my clients if they ask for it as well. Um, so they know when these potential rate increases are going to happen. Um, the one kind of exception to that rule was when COVID did happen in a six-week period, uh, we saw a 1.5% decrease uh, to that overnight lending rate uh, to, down to the 0.25% we're at now. So that's kind of, you know, the extreme end, which was obvious for the reasons that happened, right, because of the economy. So if I, if I were to put you on the spot a little bit today with, with a prediction, so if we were looking, you know, July 1, what do you think we'd be looking at for... What do you think our, our, our rates are going to be looking like within that period? So for fixed rates, we're probably going to stay around where we are now. I think the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is going to keep that kind of flat. Um, I have been getting a lot of emails recently from lenders saying that rates are going to increase uh, or are increasing. As I said, you know, for a five-year fixed, we're floating around 3 percentage right now for variables because they are determined by different factors, um, potentially a couple of increases, which means, you know, variable rates are half that of a fixed rate right now. So you're looking for a variable which will be about 1.5%, whereas a fixed rate, 3%. So that's six interest rate increases right there that you're kind of protected from. Um, even by taking the variable over the fixed right now. Yeah. So, so I guess um, one of the biggest questions I get day in and day out from clients looking at at their financing is, you know, what what's the best direction for them to take um, fixed mortgage versus versus variable. So, what, like when a client asks you that, what are the things that you, you kind of get them to consider 
um, being the best direction for them. So for the most part, my recommendation to nearly all of my clients is going to be to take a variable rate mortgage. Um, the reason for that is uh, something that people never think about, and that's what if they don't want a mortgage anymore, or what if they want to make a change to that mortgage. And that's going to be because penalties are incurred when, when you want to make a change to your mortgage. So stats have it that about 60% of Canadians will break their mortgage about three years into their five-year term. So be that they want to refinance to access equity they have in their property, refinance to pay off higher interest consumer debt, uh, people fund businesses through home equity, uh, couples come together, you know, two homes come into one, so one of them breaks the mortgage. Couples also separate as well. So when those events happen um, and you want to make a change to your mortgage, because it is a contract you're in with that lender, a penalty will apply. That penalty for a variable rate mortgage is typically significantly lower than a fixed rate mortgage. Um, so the penalty for a variable, as long as you're with the right lender, because different lenders have ways of qualifying it and some have some sneaky things they hide in the background, um, but it's going to be three months worth of interest. So essentially, you know, it's really easy to calculate. Um, if you take your mortgage balance, multiply it by the interest rate on your mortgage, divide it by four, that is three months worth of interest and that's the penalty you'll pay. Typically, that is going to work out about 0.5% of your mortgage balance. So if your mortgage was uh, 400000 let's say, um, then your penalty is going to be around 2000 it It'd actually probably be lower than that with where rates are right now. For a fixed rate mortgage, um, the penalty is typically going to be uh, the interest rate differential, which is a calculation that all lenders do with their fixed rate mortgage. Um, and uh, it works out in the favor of the lender, shockingly. Uh, it's much worse with the banks. Um, this calculation, it factors in a few different things. Again, it does depend on the lender. Um, but if you were to you know, look at an average, because it's kind of impossible to predict what that penalty would be because it's based on rates now when you took your mortgage and wherever the rates are in the future, you know, in five years time or three years time, whenever you break that mortgage, um, about 4% of the mortgage balance is what that's gonna cost you. So, you know, um, on a $400,000 mortgage, that's $16,000 as opposed to $2,000. Wow. So, yeah. you know, that's the big thing I like to make people think about is, what if you're gonna make a change? You know, life changes all the time. Your life is variable. Shouldn't your mortgage be as well? Good line. It's not mine. I took it from someone else. <laughs> there's, a, there's a very renowned mortgage broker who says that line, but it's a good one, right? Yeah. <laughs> I won't take credit for it. So uh, the the other question around that. So generally speaking, if I were if I had a five year fixed mortgage and I decide two years in, I want to move. I want to upgrade to you know I bought my starter home five hundred thousand. I'm looking at a million dollar house now. Is it fair to say that you can generally port your mortgage to your new purchase without paying a lot of penalty? So here's the thing that people don't understand as well. So just because your mortgage is portable, it doesn't mean you can port it to the new property. Okay. So when you want to port that mortgage, a lender's going to make you completely requalify for it. So they're going to check your credit again, they're going to look at your income again, they're going to look at your liabilities again. If you don't happen to qualify for that mortgage for whatever reason, um, they may not port your mortgage to the next property. And again, people don't think about that side of things either. Um, so again, that's another reason why I say the variable is typically better because, you know, let's say we have to qualify you with a different lender for whatever reason. Um, the variable rate mortgage will have the limited penalty, uh, whereas the fixed rate mortgage, that penalty could be exponential, which is you losing home equity that you've built because of how, you know, a lender, a bank, whoever decides to um, do that calculation. Uh, to cite an example I had recently, uh, so a client of mine bought a condo in Collingwood um, a couple of years ago. Uh, fixed rate mortgage, I think the rate was 1.89% or something like that. Um, she sold it, bought somewhere else firm before talking to me. Let's say this, like oh, I didn't condone Nobody, this. Nobody does that, <laughs> did I? Talk to your mortgage broker or lender first to make sure it qualifies. Um, but so she she owned a condo. She wanted to buy a condo in a different area, move. Um, she's got this great rate. She obviously wants to port her mortgage with her to that new property. The condo she's buying is a self-managed condo corp. Not every lender will do a self-managed condo corp. So because the lender we placed it with at that time, because you know they had the best rates, best options for her, wouldn't do a self-managed condo. And therefore, she had to break her mortgage and pay the penalty. Yeah. So they're the things that people don't think about. Just because your mortgage is portable doesn't mean you can port it. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I've run into that a few times, particularly with the with the local banks where I've had, you know, a client that's that's been in their house for years. They've got a mortgage with TD and, you know, nothing's really changed and they decide to make a move. Just 
assuming that they yeah. would easily qualify for the same thing again for sure because they've been a great client they've never missed a mortgage payment and then they go back to td they bought their new house and td's like nope and so, that's kind of the unfortunate thing that people do run into these days is you know back in the good old days before my time of being a broker um if you had good credit and you had you know equity in a home you could walk into a bank tell them how much you earn sign on the dotted line there you go your mortgage is done uh these days it's very much uh, provable taxable confirmable income so you know what you're paying to the cra is how we kind of qualify you yeah. um so for like an employee that's pretty straightforward you know it's your salary or your two-year average of what's on your t-force uh, for self-employed it's going to be you know your net income Income after expenses and things like that um, but yeah a lot of people don't realize you haven't been through the mortgage process for a while that there is um, a significant underwriting that does go into a mortgage these days because of regulations that you know come in over time and if you haven't done it for 15 years well you're not going to be expecting the amount of documents that uh, lenders are requesting these days yeah so that that's a good segue into uh, talking about the pre-approval process so um, something that we always recommend to our buyer clients as a first step is to talk to a, a mortgage broker before they get started um, to to understand not only their affordability but also you know their credit and and you know what the bank's going to approve them for um, for financing so can you walk us through that that process a little bit if you could and just you know talk about the things that uh, that the bank would be looking for 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 materials like you just you just touched on and you know timing what does it look like for sure so when it comes to uh, myself as a broker and what I expect most other brokers to do you know across Canada um, is we, we do all of the work for our clients up front and the reason I do that in particular is I want to hate being wrong about things so when a client comes to me and if they want to know what they're going to be pre-approved for what I can do for them it's all about me getting everything I need for their application so I'm fully prepared uh, so that means running a credit check on them there are minimum level sorry minimum levels um, of uh, credit score required requirements typically 680 as a credit score is going to be what most lenders are looking for we can work with less sometimes some lenders will scale back certain items about that um so, but we can work with a minimum score of 600 but don't strive to have a score of 600 that's not that's not that's not something you should be aiming for um but yeah 680 will get you pretty much everything you need um when we're talking about credit as well, liabilities are also reviewed on there. So, you know, if you have like truck payments and credit cards with balances, all that kind of gets looked at when we look at your credit. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, income, um, as I said uh, before, the uh, it's all about provable, taxable, confirmable income. You know, what's uh, how much you earn, what's on paper is how we're underwriting mortgages these days. Um, so uh, I request documents like all of like that up front. So for uh, an employee, that would be an employment letter, T4s and pay stubs for the past couple of years. Um, we can use things like Canada Child Benefit if children are below certain ages to increase affordability uh, for borrowers as well. Um, spousal support, um, if that's paid or child support, can be included with some lenders too. Um, for the self-employed, um, can be a bit more challenging and it depends on you know who you are, how you declare your income and things like that. So just uh, just a quick question on that one. So you know we've obviously got a lot of folks that work in the service industry and stuff here where you know, a, a major portion of their income may be uh, tip income, sure. that kind of stuff, which, you know, some of the, some of the folks may not claim a hundred percent to that. D does, the, does a lender usually provide like, um, some flexibility on that? So an A lender isn't going to provide you flexibility on that. Yeah. So um, essentially, you know, let's say you work for uh, for a restaurant, you get a T4 for your base salary. Um, if you want to add tip income, to how you qualify as well, then we're also going to ask for your um, T1 generals, the tax returns that you submit to the CRA for the past few years, yeah. and then we're going to average that tip income. This is for an A lender. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it depends how much you put on paper. Like yeah. if it's not a lot, then that's definitely going to be, you know, a challenge. So, um, so tip, tip to the self-employed, you know, there's, there's other factors to consider when you go to file your tax return, the, the, how honest you are about reporting that tip income could highly influence what you're going to qualify for. Sure, for. absolutely. Yeah, that, that's with an A lender. So with B lender, so when I say a B lender, this is someone who doesn't qualify traditionally. Yeah. Um, so for a B lender, they will look at um, uh, if you put your tip income into your bank account, uh, but it doesn't end up on your tax return for some reason. 
Um, we can look at that kind of averaged over a period of time, like six months a year. Um, however, with a B lender, you know, you're going to get rates that are higher than an A lender. You're also going to be subject to some fees as well as part of that. So let B lenders will typically charge like a 1% fee on the mortgage balance too. Yeah. Um, so it can be used, but down payment requirement is also higher. So typically at least 20%. If you're going to buy somewhere, you know, more remote, even higher down payment required. So um, again, it's all about having a conversation. And uh, I always you know, talk to people through all these kind of things. Once I've got their documents, I will review all of that with them uh, to kind of confirm, you know, if you are going to be an A client and if you are, what, you know, to expect uh, rate wise and documentation wise, or so I should have reviewed that documentation already. But um, for B clients, um, yeah, it's definitely more challenging. Um, Self-employed, I was going to talk about as well. So um, that's, you know, uh, uh, someone who earns tips is an, an employee. And then it's kind of like, I guess, commission income, right? The uh, um, Or additional income, the tip income. But for the self-employed, um, again, not every self-employed person may qualify with an A lender. Because if we're looking at, you know, your net income after expenses on your tax return, some accountants can do a very good job of writing down people's income so they don't pay that much to the mm -hmm. CRA. Um, that doesn't help you when it comes to qualifying for a mortgage. So, um, you know, typically with an A lender, we're going to be looking at about four and a half, five times your income is what you're going to qualify for yeah. uh, mortgage wise. Um, you know, if your income, let's say you have $100,000 gross income, but, you know, after all your expenses, you write it down to $20,000. Well, five times your income is going to be 100k there the loan you're going to qualify for so you know that what does that get you these days mike in the market yeah yeah <laughs> zero yeah. zero um so so i want to talk a little bit about um the the difference of of working with a mortgage broker like yourself versus going down to your local bank where you keep your checking account so sure. um and, and I'd like to give you just uh, an example that I've heard a number of times from my clients where uh, they walk down to the bank, they set up a meeting with uh, with the local bank and they say, OK, I want to buy a house. So they start going through that pre-approval with the bank. And in my experience, oftentimes it's a very short meeting and the bank asks them a few questions and they say, OK, OK, Mike, I think you're approved for $800,000. So my client comes back to me and says, I've talked to the bank, Mike, I'm good to go anything up to 800,000. We, we start shopping for houses, they, uh, they, they secure a home, we put in a financing condition, and then we go to the bank to say, um, hey, here's here's what we bought, we need to finalize the, the financing. And I can tell you, so many times, it's at that point where the local bank says, well, I'm gonna need you to give me all, all your documents. Yeah. And when our client gives all their documents over, even if they're the same as what they stated in that, that initial meeting, the bank's like, well, you don't, you don't qualify. So uh, explain to me the difference between what you do when you qualify someone for their mortgage versus what they may experience if they just go to their, their local bank. For sure. So we've got two different items that we're kind of talking here and what banks will typically do for their clients is they'll pre-qualify. So pre-qualifying and pre-approval are two different things. Pre-qualifying basically means they're taking you as the client or the borrower at your word about um, you know how much you earn, about what your credit score is, about what your liabilities are. I can tell you from experience, most people don't have those numbers accurately when it comes to you know me actually doing my thing when it comes to pre-approving. So the difference with the pre-approval and how we kind of you know put that as a broker or say that as a broker is it means I've checked your credit. It means I've got your income documents, I've reviewed them, I've confirmed them, um, I've reviewed your liabilities, so I know exactly you know, how much um, uh, your car payment we have to factor into the equation, uh, what the balances are on your credit cards. Um, when I'm doing that with my clients as well, I'm also discussing about other options for them. So if we're looking at you know, a credit card they're carrying a balance on, uh, let's say they've got a 5k balance, we have to include um, a payment associated with that which is typically going to be 3% um, of that balance. Um, I say to my clients, you know, do you pay this off every month? Okay, you do. Fantastic. So can you get me um, uh, just a statement that shows you pay this off and it's at a $0 balance? Great. Well, now your affordability is going to increase by this much. Um, what if, you know, instead of using all of this money for your down payment, um, we pay off your car loan, which has a small balance on it because the payment on that is $1,000 a month. Uh, but, you know, you've only got five grand. So we take five grand off your... Uh, five grand off your um, down payment and we just apply it to this well now you qualify for this much more um, because 
I see car and truck payments make huge differences to how people yeah. qualify for mortgages. So I guess it, it's more of a consultative process. And I, I guess the big biggest difference that I can see between working with a, a, a mortgage professional, that that's all they do, versus someone that's a, that's a bank employee is that you can advise a client on the moves that he needs to make so you can package up you know, the strongest file to present to the lender versus just, you know, here's five minutes, send it off yeah. to the lender and the lender says, well, that doesn't look that good. So the so. difference is that I'm fully underwriting a mortgage myself before I send it to one of my lending partners to underwrite it. So I do all of that work. I know um, guidelines for multiple different lenders out there. So my job is to know all the different lenders I work with, how they qualify certain forms of income um, to give you, you know, the best edge, the maximum pre-approval. That person who you go to in a bank could be a jack of all trades, could just be a teller, someone who's just started. How much do you think they know about mortgages if they don't do it all the time? Um, what happens is they will kind of have a standard set of documents they'll know to collect from you and they'll pick them up and then they'll send it to someone else. But they won't send it to that someone else to underwrite it until you have an accepted offer on a property. That's the only point they become interested in you. And then they'll tell you whether they can or can't do it. Whereas, you know, I'm looking at all of that ahead of time. I'm making sure my clients are set up for success. Um, and then when it comes to, um, you know, buying the property as well, I'm also talking to a realtor ahead of time. Because if I think there's any issues that I see with the property, I always like to know the property my client's going to buy so I can look at any red flags. So if you see something like, as is, where is on the uh, the realtor remarks or handyman special. Um, if the roof looks like terrible, like it's going to uh, fall in any second. Um, these are the kind of things that lenders are going to want to appraise a property for um, or could just be a flat out no for approval. So I would do as much as I possibly can to set my clients up for success by doing all of that work up front for them. So it may sound like I ask people for a lot, a lot of documents. I'm just doing it now because the work's going to be done at some point. So it's either do it up front or do it in the rear. Well, yeah. if I do it up front, then you're ready to go. And then when you have that offer accepted on a house, I'm getting you an approval within a day or two. Yeah. So so I guess at the end of the day, a, a pre-approval is just it, it is just something that you're giving the buyer to say that we're probably going to be able to finance you for, the, for this amount. When it comes to it, like actually buying a property, there, there's going to be some variables, like yeah. like like you just mentioned. So so, so I like, it's sorry to cut you off, but just so in this environment that we're in right now, where you know multiple offers are the are the norm, and to be competitive, you, most likely you're not going to be able to provide a financing condition. Um, a client's got their pre approval from you. Can they can they assume that if there's not an issue with the house that what what got approved is what they're definitely going to get or or what does the pre-approval actually mean at the end of the day? So there are still potential challenges that come around with pre-approvals like that. Um, for the most part, when someone says a pre-approval these days, um, if you're getting something from a lender, it's a rate hold. So they're locking in a rate for you for 120 days because your credit's been checked then and they'll hold that for you in case the market increases. Um, when it comes to getting uh, a final approval on a property, the one thing is that that property has never been approved ahead of time. So a lender won't pre-approve a property. Um, that's kind of part of my job is to look at that and see if I see any red flags uh, from a lender's perspective. Um, the one thing with multiple offers and people not adding financing conditions and going hundreds of thousands of dollars over asking price is that lenders need to um, confirm that the property you're buying and that they're placing a loan on it's worth what you paid for it because worst case scenario, you default on your mortgage. They have to repossess that property um, and they have to sell it. Are they going to recoup their money? So what they will do is if they can't support that value, um, lenders will typically try and remotely appraise a property these days. So we call it an AVM, an automated valuation model. Um, so what they do is they have a program, they look at the property you're buying, they look at the price you pay, they click a button and it looks for recent comparable sales to see if that value can be supported. If the value can't be supported, then what they'll do is they'll condition for a physical appraisal of the property. So we have to hire an appraiser to go in, and that is at the client's expense typically, even though it's for the benefit of the lender, you know, you're looking to buy this house and you're looking for this loan. Um, so the appraiser will go in, uh, they will do a physical appraisal of the property, they will look round. Number one, they're looking to confirm the value of that property to make sure you know you haven't overpaid it. So they're gonna go back after they've viewed the property, do their thing, and uh, look for you know recent comparable sales. They have um, a lot more 
uh, uh, access a lot more information than like the uh, the computer program would. Um, so they will look at that to support the value. The other kind of flip side of that though, and the thing people don't think about, is even if the value is approved, um, the appraiser is also reviewing the property specifics. So if there's something fundamentally wrong with that property, let's say a crack in the foundation, knob and tube wiring. No water. Uh, <clears throat> well, yeah, no water. Uh, yeah. Kitech plumbing, for example, yeah. which is known to, it's not if it's um, uh, going to fail, it's when it's going to fail. Yeah. These could all be reasons why a lender flat out wouldn't put um, any kind of loan on a property. Um, so there's always that aspect that people don't think to uh, think about. And I'm always pre-warning people about that. And that's the real risk when you don't add a financing condition to an offer, which, as you know, is you yeah. don't really get a ch chance to do that these days, right? Just yeah. because of um, the market we're in, because you're going to be outbid. But there is a lot that people don't realize that even if you're pre-approved for a certain amount, <clears throat> um, you know, there could be an issue with the property. Yeah. Um Another side would be that if the property under appraises in value, so let's say you know uh, you bought a property for a, a million dollars, the appraiser goes in and he says it's only worth 900k, so it's a hundred thousand dollars under value. So not only do you have to come up with the minimum down payment on that nine hundred thousand uh, dollars, that would vary depending if you put in uh, you know if you need mortgage default insurance or not, um, but you have to come up with that difference, so that hundred k. So yeah. they will give you a loan based on the nine hundred, not on the million, but you paid a million dollars for it, so now you need another hundred k. On yeah. top of that. So I just dealing with the exact same um, situation right now. I've got a client that's putting an offer in on a home here in Thornbury. There's we're expecting 10 plus. So it's listed at a million three hundred and seventy thousand. And they're they're trying to determine where they need to be to com to be competitive. And it's likely way over asking, which they're prepared to pay. Uh, but we had to have a conversation yeah. about that yesterday. Like it's it's likely when I when I do the analysis on this property that any appraiser is going to have difficulty come up coming up with a value that's much more than the listing price yeah. in this case. So I said to them, you're going to need to be prepared to make up that that shortfall. So like yeah. you said, it's down payment plus whatever shortfall we had there, provided they're they're planning on financing as much as they as they can on it, right? Yeah. So, so. Um, another kind of thing that I would do for my clients as well, um, I will talk to an appraiser about a property ahead of time. So I had clients who bought a place in um, uh, Meaford recently. Uh, you know, it's it was in first time home buyer range. They paid you know significantly over the asking price uh, before they even placed that offer. I talked to my appraiser. I was like, this is probably what they're going to pay. Do you think you can support that value? Yeah. And he was confident that based on recent local comparable sales that he could. So that mitigates some risk for my clients as well. And that, that's that's usually a, a consultative approach that you and I have too. If we're if we've got a, a mutual client, the, the client's asking you whether or not they can do it. And then oftentimes you're calling me to say, Mike, can you can you support it with comparables? Absolutely. I want to right? see the comps. So, I want to know that if someone's yeah. gonna pay something, that yeah. yeah, that we've got other properties around that are, you know, similar, good comparable sales, recent as well for the most part. Lenders are typically looking within 90 days. Uh, we can get away with a bit a bit greater than 90 days in our area because you know sales aren't always um there aren't as many sales as you know a market like the gta um but yeah absolutely having a good idea about comps is is essential to make yeah. sure that you know the client isn't gonna uh overpay or run into an issue where they don't have enough funds so or, having yeah. a backup plan is or at important. least not be aware that they're overpaying based on appraisal value For sure um so we touched on it a little bit during that conversation about rate hold so uh, so, something that's particularly important with the way that rates are trending right now. So, so I think you mentioned there that most lenders will give you a 120 day rate hold with a pre approval. So, which it, it, am I fair to say that if if I lock that rate in now, uh, I can buy anything up until the end of that 100 day 120 day period and be guaranteed that rate of today property would have to close within that time frame okay so the reason why lenders do that it's actually because of the credit so the day you pull the credit is the day that they'll run the rate hold from um so if you let's say didn't buy something for uh you were two months into that so 60 days into that and then you bought something and the closing window was outside of that so another 90 days so then we're at like 150 days so a lender would re-pull your credit under that scenario and then you will be subject to the rates at that time so a rate hold is you know only good for closing within that window as well 
Yeah. Um, okay. so there are some lenders who go a little bit longer, so we can get a year out of some lenders as well. Um, not necessarily going to be the most competitive rates when you're locking in something that long, but I mean, yeah. if it's a rising rate environment, then it may make sense to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about about down payments uh, because this is uh, there's a few misconceptions out there. It's a lot. <laughs> of, uh, okay, more more than a few about what's required to buy a house. So and, and we've got. We've got a couple different um, channels here. One being principal residence versus, you know, a second home or an investment property. So, so generally speaking, if I wanted to, if I wanted to buy my first home, five hundred thousand, which you're probably not buying it here, but <laughs> anywhere but, really, but, but Nova uh, Scotia maybe. <laughs> what what percentage of that purchase price would would I typically need to to be able to get a mortgage? For sure. So if the property price is five hundred thousand dollars or under then the minimum down payment is gonna be 5% of that. Um, that's with a, uh, we call it mortgage default insured mortgage, uh, or CMHC people refer to it as. Um, CMHC, is, CMHC is the largest and government run provider of mortgage default insurance. There are two other providers out there as well. Uh, Sajin is one of them and Canada Guarantee is the other. Um, but so yeah, if the purchase price is $500,000 or less, then it's gonna be 25K as the minimum down payment. Um, if the property is between 500,000 and uh, 990, $99,999, then the minimum uh, down payment is going to be 5% uh, of the first 500,000 and then 10% of that difference. So okay. let's say you bought for 600K and then the down payment will be 35,000. So 25K of the 500 and then uh, 100K of the, the 100. So the difference between the 500 and the 600. Okay. Here's the, here's the real thing though. Once you, uh, if you buy for $1 million, so, um, the minimum down payment is there going to be then going to be twenty percent. So if you bought for nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine, the minimum down payment is seventy five thousand dollars. If you spend one dollar more, you need one hundred twenty five thousand dollars more as the down payment. Wow! So you better negotiate hard. Negotiate hard. You can keep it under a million. <laughs> I mean, it depends how much what you have available yeah. to you. Um, the number of parental gifts we're seeing these days is like unbelievable. I think I saw some stats saying about forty percent of uh, first-time buyers um, yeah. in twenty twenty-one um, used a parental gift. And I think the average was about seventy thousand yeah, dollars. I read this. I read the same yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Well, that's, I mean, that's, it's yeah. getting to be the point where that's the only way you can get into the market yeah, as a absolutely. younger person. With the prices right? these days. Um, and you, you mentioned second homes as well, so I should touch on that. Um, actually, second homes uh, are subject to the same down payment requirements um, as uh, uh, primary residences that I just mentioned. So you can buy a second home again with 5% down if it's under 500. Um, a lot of people have that misconception. They think it's only for first time buyers where you can put the, the minimum down payment down. It's not true. Anyone can do it these days okay. uh, and for investment properties the absolute minimum is going to be a 20 percent down payment some lenders uh, so, have different requirements for that too okay so so if i'm if i'm buying a cottage say as a second home yep. i'm buying i live in toronto i'm buying my second home here yep. subject to a, a few variables obviously i can probably buy it with five percent down up here yeah if it's under 500k yeah yeah but, okay you know, where are you gonna buy somewhere from 500k yeah. but yeah. yeah absolutely if it's a second home um but it's the, but it's the same it doesn't go to the 20 percent because no, i think a lot of people think that it's yeah that it's absolutely 20. Um, and and why the difference between a second home versus an investment property in terms of the downstroke so the difference need. is the mortgage default insurance so when you have a second home, we can get the mortgage default insurance on it, which means you can do a down payment less than 20%. Um, a rental property, investment property, you cannot default insure a pure investment property. Therefore, you have to have a 20% down payment. Okay. So mortgage default insurance has um, certain rules attached to it. So number one, well, can't be an investment property, as I said. Um, the ma maximum amortization is going to be 25 years. Uh, we have to qualify you at uh, what we call the benchmark rate. So right now, we qualify people at um, a rate of 5.25%. That's as of the time of recording this, unless this changes, of course. Um, and the uh, the purchase price has to be below a million. So they're all kind of criteria for mortgage default insurance, as well as you know credit criteria and um, uh, income uh, co uh, qualification as well. So there is some pretty strict rules around mortgage default insurance and there's not much flexibility um, of how we can kind of um, go around them. There's a few programs like for um, self-employed, which are really good programs under certain circumstances. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the main difference and why you can do that for a, a second home, which would be a property that you live in as opposed to an investment property, which is one that you, know, you buy and put someone else in.
yeah. and rent out. Um, once again, another another good segue into uh, investment properties, and it this this is a not just an opportunity, but something that I'm getting asked more often about because because of the speed that our market's been appreciating. I mean, most people that have been in the market for for even more than six months has has built up a significant amount of equity in their homes. So, uh, what are what are my options? uh in in terms of accessing that equity to to maybe use it to buy an investment property yes yeah, so um you know let's just kind of cite an example i guess so let's say someone bought a property for five hundred thousand dollars you know a few years ago and now it's worth a million uh if their mortgage balance is 400k let's say um as long as they income qualify for it they can access um a maximum of eight hundred thousand dollars so their income needs to show that they could kind of you know be able to afford that but that means they could access four hundred thousand dollars to do whatever they want with like you said buy a boat and they could also you know pay off higher interest consumer debt or buy an investment property um so if they want to buy an investment property, um, you aren't allowed to 100% finance a property in Canada. So you know you can't um, uh, you can't fully finance a property like you used to be able to back in the day. Um, so, but if you want to buy an investment property and you've got a, a primary residence with equity in it, you can leverage the down payment from that. So if you have your 400k mortgage right now, we could add like a second mortgage component, let's say for. $200,000 or whatever. And then you could use that as a down payment on a, an investment property. You could use it as a down payment on a second home. Um, and then we are essentially 100% financing it through the equity in your home and through the equity um, or and through the mortgage on the, the second property that you're buying. Um, beneficial reasons for you know buying an investment property would be, I mean, you've seen what the investment market is uh, right now with how much you can get for rental income so as long as it kind of cash flows for you um and you know i assume we think property is going to continue going up in value with how few homes there are in canada being built and what we need to do to stabilize this market that you know you can put someone in there have them pay your mortgage uh, for you um you get you know certain write-offs with investment properties as well like the mortgage interest is uh, deductible on that investment property if you leveraged the equity from your current home as well that's also um tax deductible as well that interest too um, and any expenses associated with that investment property too. So, you know, property taxes, if you pay the heat hydro, water, um, maintenance, uh, repairs, um, anything like that is all tax deductible. So, you know, in the long run, a lot of people have built huge amounts of net worth themselves, you know, in the past few years alone yeah. um, uh, by owning, you know, multiple properties. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the one big thing that gets missed with most mm. most homeowners is that they just don't know how to access that money and put it to work for them so not in in like you touched on it's not just about buying another property but there's so many people out there that you know have a high interest car loan or something like that and they're sitting on all this equity on their house and they're paying a 7% 7% car loan right when they could just access that money pay down that that high interest debt and just roll it into their mortgage. So let's right? let's just look at this. So let's say you bank with a green bank for argument's sake uh, and your mortgage is with green bank and your unsecured line of credit with a balance on it is with green bank and your high interest car loan is with green bank. Do you think green bank is going to tell you that you should refinance your house and take the lower interest rate in your mortgage or do you think they're going to tell you to keep uh, your products that make them more money at higher interest rates yeah um, and that's another you know job of the broker i look at people's situations and i ask them kind of what they're paying on these things and i'm like look i could refinance you pay off this um the interest rate is going to be significantly lower yeah. um you know set people up with strategies for how to pay that down quicker as well yep. um, because you know it doesn't always make sense to take a loan and put it in something you amortize over 25 years but if i tell them how to you know how much they should assign each month to this to use yep. their prepayment privileges to bring the balance down so they are you know better off financially in the long run so there's lots of things you can do with home equity that people just don't realize yeah. and they will carry balances on you know credit cards that have 20 percent on them or whatever which is just you know yeah crazy right when you could get a variable rate mortgage right now for one and a half percent so yeah so so bottom line is someone doesn't access your expertise just just to buy a house i mean it's probably worth setting up a call with you if if you're in that situation where you've got other types of debt out there and you've got home equity yeah. they can talk to you and maybe put together a plan that's going to save you a ton of money on on you know bad 
well, I shouldn't call it bad debt, but debt, debt, higher interest debt. You may be able to clean that up with your with your home equity line. Unfortunately, mortgages yeah. have a lot of bad stigma around them. You know, years ago, mortgages rates were a lot higher, right? 14, 18, 20 percent or whatever. Before my time of owning a property, I've only ever been in the low interest rate uh, environment. Um, but yeah, you know, people don't like having a mortgage. And what people forget is when you're making a mortgage payment, you're not just paying interest on it every time. A huge amount of that with rates this low is going to principal. Every time you make a principal payment, you're putting money in your bank because that's more home equity for yourself. So yeah, I, I don't describe mortgages as bad debt, but when you look at a credit card with a rate of 20%, or if you have a car loan, the rate's you know, 7.5%, 8%, because maybe your credit's a, a bit less desirable than they wanted it to be. Um, there are definite ways that you can you know i can strategize for people and show them how they can you know be better off financially and reduce their monthly payments yeah it's definitely a generational uh shift with debt yeah. i know we we're talking about it this morning in the office like with our parents and it was always like the main financial advice that i ever got from my dad and that was and he was a ca right was right if you have extra money you top up your rsp and you pay down your mortgage right but it's really it, it's not the same as it was in their generation. The interest yeah. rates, like you said, are so low that this type of this type of mortgage debt isn't isn't what it once was. And I can only attest to it by some of my wealthiest clients I know are carrying car carry mortgage. big mortgages, <laughs> not because they don't have the money to just buy it with cash, but you know they they obviously know something. So. <laughs> So. Here's another tactic that people can do. So there's something which is called the Smith Maneuver. Um, I won't go into huge depth about what it is. You can look it up online. There's a book about it. Fraser Smith wrote it. But essentially, you can use your home uh, as, or you can leverage your home uh, to invest in um, uh, non-registered investments that are income producing. And then you can deduct that interest cost as well. So, you know, if you could put a million dollar loan on your house because it's worth whatever it is, if you took that million dollars and you were going to pay one and a half, two percent on it as a mortgage. And then you gave that million dollars to your financial advisor and he went and invested for you, that, that for you in non-registered investments or even if you had TFSA space or RSP space. Um, what's your financial advisor going to make you? Are they going to make you, you know, at least seven, eight percent or even potentially more? Um, who's going to be better off in the long run? You know, you making that monthly payment with your mortgage and your financial advisor making you significantly more over here. That is why wealthy people leverage their homes so that to make themselves wealthier in the future. Yeah. And as I said, that interest is tax deductible as well. Um, if it's structured correctly, you want to make sure you set it up correctly. Uh, and the reason you want to do that is if the CRA ever sees that you're um, writing off interest on your primary residence, they're going to want to know why you're doing that. Yeah. So as long as you set it up correctly, the financial advisor knows what they're doing. Your accountant knows what you're doing as well and why you're writing this off. You can make your principal residence um, uh, mortgage interest tax deductible, which you actually technically can't do in Canada. In the States, they let you just write it off anyway. But in Canada, we don't get that privilege unless you are using it for investment purposes. Right. Oh, interesting. So, um, so we talked about uh, accessing that um, for buying rental properties, buying that kind of stuff. But sometimes it just comes down to something simple like you know, a, a client is is considering moving because they don't like a certain aspect of the house. Like, you know, they, they need a new kitchen and they don't want to spend the money for that or they need a small addition to accommodate their house. But they don't have the cash to pay for that. So uh, one of the most simple approaches is just to talk to your lender, talk to your mortgage broker about extending a home equity line of credit. Is that is that fair? Yeah, so you can yeah. do it with a home equity line of credit or you can do it with a mortgage as well. Um, there are reasons for doing both. Um, if you do a home equity line of credit, the trouble that some people have with that is that uh, you only have to pay the interest on it. So the rates are a bit higher on it because it is fully open, which means it can be repaid at any time, but it's like an interest only loan. So you could just pay interest, 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 interest. You have to be forced, or you have to force yourself to think I'm gonna pay my principal balance down on this home equity line of credit as well. With a mortgage, you are forced into making that regular principal and interest payment. So for some people, you know, um, I've got some clients right now doing a basement renovation. They want the mortgage to do that. 
because they want to make sure they pay down their balance over time. They don't want to be stuck with something that they have to think, you know, um, uh, how much are we going to assign to the, the line of credit each week or each month, sorry. Um, so that's kind of the differences. Um, home equity lines of credit these days go through exactly the same underwriting the mortgages do. So that's something that people don't realize as well, is if you if you want a HELOC, um, you're qualifying for a mortgage. It's done in exactly the same way, so there's no difference between the two. So if I wanted to... so. If I wanted to refinance my house, mm -hmm. so I'm three years into my five five year term, and I just because interest rates are going up, and you know maybe I don't have a great rate right now based mm -hmm. on what it's been over the last year and a half. What what does that process look like? Um, so obviously I have to go through the qualification and whatnot. Yeah. But if if I want to refinance now. What kind of penalties and stuff like what what does that look like so that's what people don't realize as well so even if you only wanted to let's say you wanted to access what lower rate or if you wanted you know a little bit more of a loan like even like 20k to just do like a bathroom reno or something a lender doesn't just qualify you for that 20k they're qualifying you for the whole loan again um so penalty wise is going to depend on you know your own unique situation the lender you're with the rate you had at the time where rates are now um i had people who came to me during covid um you know if they, they had big bank mortgages um when I ran the analysis for them, I was like, this is what your penalty is going to be. Like, by the end of your mortgage term, you're not going to have recouped any of that money to yourself. So do you really want to do this? So it doesn't necessarily always make sense for people to refinance. But if you do want to do it, there's going to be a penalty attached to it. Some lenders will say, well, we won't charge you a penalty. You know, you want an additional 50K or whatever. Uh, so what they do is they blend the mortgage or mortgages together. So mm -hmm. they'll give you or they'll tell you, you know, you've got your mortgage for 200k at whatever rate it's at you want another 50k um they'll give it to you at a combined rate they'll say they're not charging you a penalty but then they'll just increase that rate a little bit more to factor in the penalty so you're paying it either way which is another reason why i tell people about variable rate mortgages over fixed because you know what the penalty is going to be um um I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> <laughs> My train of thought so, just went there. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, we've, we've gone through a lot of stuff, and this is kind of circling back to uh, what we had previously talked about, working with the bank versus working with a with a mortgage broker. So um, just to kind of sum up what you, you had said, I, I mean, it comes down to um, the intensity of the, the pre-approval process um, that you – fully go through all that documentation to have that client as sure as they can be about their their financing versus mm -hmm. a quick conversation that's not necessarily backed up by paperwork but what is it what does it look like when you when you have somebody come in for financing um, obviously I, if I walked into the Royal Bank or TD you know T TD is 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 giving me my mortgage and the, what they offer is what they offer. Yeah. How, how does it how does it work with a with a broker? Like, do you do you select a specific a specific lender based on that person, or do you you put it out to everybody and see see who who comes back? So, what people think, I think, or what people I I think they think about brokers is that uh, we get your application, all your documents, and then we just send it off to ten different lenders, and whoever comes back with the best rate is the one we kind of go with. Um, how it actually works is uh, I have a knowledge of uh, all the banks I work with, all of the um, we call them monoline lenders or mortgage financing companies. So these are mortgage only lenders. Um, we work with a lot of them. They're not available to people unless you're um, uh, going through a broker. So it's not like TD who works on you know every street corner. But my job is to know their policies, to know bank policies that I work with. And then based on your own unique circumstances and you know what you do, um, I know how I can kind of man manipulate, increase your income for like self-employed people. Um, uh, some lenders, when it comes to like averaging things like bonuses and commission income, won't let us use um, if it's more than like a 20% gap. Some lenders won't do, um, uh, sorry, a 20% difference uh, with the uh, the income. They won't let us use like the full like average, whereas other lenders don't care. So my job is to know policies for multiple different lenders. And then when someone comes to me, I'm looking at their whole situation. And that's kind of how I'm pre-approving them. So, you know, if you walked into RBC. RBC has an RBC shaped box. If you don't fit in the RBC shaped box, then you may not qualify there or you'll only qualify for a certain amount with RBC. But there are some unique programs out there uh, for the self-employed, uh, for people who are new to Canada that not all lenders participate in. So, you know, again, as a broker, it's about 
product knowledge for multiple different lenders. Um, so, you know, you get out of mortgage brokering what you put into it. So I'm very invested in it and I, you know, continuously uh, continual learning and education. Uh, lenders do like seminars for us all the time uh, that I attend constantly to make sure I'm up to date with their products and, you know, all the offerings they have. What I always tell clients, the difference between walking to your bank in, in, in getting your mortgage there versus working with a mortgage broker like yourself is that you don't get paid unless you put the mortgage together. So, you Absolutely. know, you, you want somebody that's motivated to work hard for you, hire the guy that doesn't get paid unless he gets it done, right? Yeah, so, for sure. And some people yeah. have the, the common misconception that brokers will charge them fees. You know, there are some cowboy brokers out there who will charge their clients fees for A, lender mortgages. Um, most lenders don't allow that. So if you're working with a broker and they're funding a, a mortgage with an A lender, and when I say an A lender, think someone with the best interest rates available to you, yeah. they shouldn't be charging you a fee for that. Uh, and I don't charge my clients fees. So I get paid. Um, yeah, it's commission on the mortgage loan, uh, the, the volume of the mortgage that we fund. Um, that varies from lender to lender, uh, what we get. Um, the rate isn't increased uh, for the client. Um, you know, um, some people think that if they work with me, so I work with TD and Scotia, let's say, um, if they went to Scotia directly, they think they get a better rate because they're going to include like a, a little bonus to the rate for working with a broker. It's not true. Lenders don't do that because we have access to so many different lenders. Mm -hmm. We have rate specials constantly that come through our email inbox. So, you know, for my, myself, it's um, number one, making sure the client qualifies and me, you know, pre-approving from the absolute maximum that I can. And then, of course, getting the best rates and terms and things like that. There are some truly awful mortgage products out there which um, have the lowest rates on them. Um, but uh, one uh, example is... Um, no, I won't name a lender. Uh, <laughs> and we'll call it, I, I'm not going to badmouth lenders. Are you, you going to call it Green Bank again? No, it's not Green Bank, actually. Uh, <laughs> no one knows who I'm talking about. This, this, isn't, this isn't a bank product, but there are some of these monoline lenders have, uh, we'll call them no frills mortgages. So the rate will be maybe like 0.1% better. Um, so, you know, some brokers will use that to entice their clients because they have a better rate than the other broker they were talking to. Um, however... Uh, some of these come with, uh, it's called a bona fide sales uh, clause, which basically means you cannot get out of that mortgage unless you sell your property in an arm's length transaction. So if you ever wanted to refinance, you couldn't move to a different lender. You're stuck with that lender, all because you wanted a 0.1% um, you know, better rate. Um, you won't get privileges like prepayment privileges with that. Uh, you won't get uh, like portability, um, things like that as well. So just because you're getting the lowest rate, it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting the best product for yeah. you for now and for the future. Yeah, like everything else, get what you pay for. Get what you pay for. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I think we covered a, a lot of great stuff today. Uh, I know constantly getting hammered with questions about around financing, and I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there about it. So I can say in my 13 years selling real estate that working with working with a trusted broker is gives you a huge advantage as a buyer. And just to kind of circle back to what we were just talking about, I mean, I've seen it many times where not only was it not a premium to, so as an example, client walks into Green Bank, gets quoted a rate, the client is thinking that that's where they're going to get the best deal from Green Bank. I, I put them in touch with you. You shop that same mortgage with the same bank. And not only is it not not a premium for you for them to work outside of it, but they got a better rate, less money through the same same lender. One of my favorite things to do, and I've done this in the past, is uh, a client's gone to a bank and they've been uh, denied by the bank for the loan. And I've taken that loan back to the same bank uh, because we work with like an underwriting channel as opposed to them going directly to the branch yeah. uh, and then getting them approved with that lender because uh, I've structured the mortgage in like a different way. I've, you know, yep. uh, just knowing what you're doing and how you put an application together is the most important thing. And that's how you get quick approvals when you send it to a lender. Yep. Um, if you send them like nice, clean, perfect deals that you've fully underwritten, you've Explained everything, any kind of discrepancy on a credit bureau, um, anything to do with like their liabilities and credit and how you've adjusted it. Yeah. You get approvals. I mean, some of our lenders commit to us to approve mortgages in four hours. Yeah. So is it, it, it in my experience, and you tell me if this is fair to say this, is is that certain lenders trust you and your reputation. So if if you put forward a client and it has it has your seal of approval, that oftentimes that's enough to 
to push it over the goalpost. I, I, I can just say from specific example where a client's gone into the bank, the bank is denied, right? most of the time that's the end of the road for the bank, right? The banks, well, they like, you know, we, we sent it to head office. They said no versus I've had it where, where you send it up the line, they say no. And then that becomes a back and forth. Like, what do you mean? No. Like, I think you should look at this guy because you know, he's got, he, he's solid. And I think that this is somebody you want to lend to. A big part of it is about the relationship that we have with our underwriters. So my underwriter or my favorite lender, I won't know who they are, but we have the best relationship. He's amazing to work with. Um, if I'm sending him something tricky, something challenging, um, I sent him a deal, I think, last year. Uh, he basically said to me, if anyone else sent me to this, they wouldn't have packaged it in the way you did, and I wouldn't have even underwritten, underwritten it. Yeah. Uh, it took him a long time to work through it, but when you have that kind of relationship with someone and you send them like good quality deals all the time, they're trusting that you've done all of that work ahead of time for your clients. So they're, you know, confident in you and your ability and how you've pre-qualified, pre-approved that client, how you've underwritten it yourself, that they're willing to take it on. Whereas, you know, because we have such a good relationship, he tells me about other people who send him mortgages uh, and they just don't send all the information they need. They won't send all the documents up. And if they don't get documents, they won't underwrite a mortgage. So, you know, it's really important the relationships brokers have with their underwriters too. Yeah. Um, of course, we have preferential lender partners. Um, you know, I believe the lenders I work with are the best for uh, the reasons that, you know, they have the best portability options in the future for their mortgages or the best prepayment privileges or just how I can qualify people like so well with them. So, you know, we all have kind of a select few. Um, as I said, rates not always the most important. It's about other aspects that you're not thinking about with your yeah. mortgage as well. But yeah, relationships for brokers with their underwriters is absolutely huge and essential. If you've got something that's a bit, you know, borderline that your underwriter is going to go to bat for you and he'll take it higher if he needs higher approval for that. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's stop it there because uh, this is uh, it's been a lot of information to consume, but a lot of great stuff. I think it answers a lot of questions that people have. So thanks so much for coming on the show. We'll put uh, all your information in the show notes so everybody knows how to reach out to you if Perfect. they want to a get financing for a new house or even to talk to you in a more consultative um, way to talk about how they might. Um, you know, reorganize their debt and, and access some of that that home equity. For sure, yeah. So, so if you put my website on um, uh, on the link, then uh, you can book a consultation with me directly from uh, from my link on the website. So you'll see it. Awesome. Thanks, Perfect. Tim. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Cheers.